It's no secret that LEGO Star Wars is one of, if not the most popular theme LEGO has going on, and with it comes a lush history of products, stories, and lots and lots of minifigs. 2024 marks the 25th anniversary of LEGO Star Wars, and with it on the horizon, I want to take a look back and absorb all that's released over the years, giving you my observations on what once was, and maybe some insight into what might come in the future. This retrospective is something I've wanted to do for a very long time, and figured out an angle to take this adventure in so that you get an all-encompassing look at the LEGO Star Wars theme from someone who has been there from the beginning, all the way back in 1999. Of course, if we're going to start somewhere, it's there, but we're not going to tackle this on a year-by-year -year basis. Rather, we're going to take it from the approach of different eras, or ages, using terms that are both historical and meaningful just for the fun of it. This is the eras of LEGO Star Wars, and where better to start than the beginning? No, literally. Well, it's likely you know the basics. Oleg Kirk changing from wooden toys to plastic toys, his son Godfred inventing the modern LEGO brick, LEGO themes straying from the contemporary with perspective of the time. You know that classic LEGO set period so many people look back on? It's at the tail end of that we find LEGO at the crux of its creativity. Castles with factions, pirates sailing the seven seas, space had aliens of all shapes and sizes. A uniquely LEGO globetrotting adventure had only just had its start in the adventurer's theme. Very humble, yet very lush concepts with an essence able to germinate the seeds of childhood-defining stories at the fingertips of children everywhere. Simple minifigures, boxy builds that communicated what they were, all being shaped in a way where they imply that they can be reconfigured into different builds, and evoking a limitless perspective on the fiction of the concepts they were basing their products off of. It was a conceptual playground. So you'd be shocked to hear me say that LEGO was nearly bankrupt at that time, yes? This was during a period where LEGO's design team were product designers, but not necessarily toy designers, leading to some costly gimmicks that simply were not turning a profit. New ideas were necessary, and when offered the idea of accepting a license agreement, a would-be first for the modern LEGO at the time, executives on their end were not enthusiastic. LEGO was very serious about keeping up with an image of being anti-war, and an IP with war in the name didn't help placate things. It was then family owner, Kel Kirk Christiansen, who made the executive decision to pursue the venture, not knowing it would eventually account for a sixth of all product sales in its launch year. Through 2001, LEGO Star Wars had kept a very specific identity for itself, most of which we would hardly see in place today, but with how standardized and advanced LEGO sets have become. It should be said, Star Wars was not the first license LEGO ever worked with. One of their original wooden toys was of Pluto, Mickey's dog, well before Star Wars was ever owned by Disney, let alone conceptualized. In 1999, LEGO also made an entire Duplo theme based off of Winnie the Pooh, so you could say LEGO Star Wars is the first fully-fledged licensed LEGO set theme using LEGO's standard brick system. And what better way to open the floodgates than with plenty of sets based off of the iconic original trilogy that put Star Wars on the map in the first place. LEGO having the license also came at an opportune time, because a brand new trilogy of Star Wars films was about to release with Star Wars Episode I The Phantom Menace showing up in late spring of 1999. Sets launched alongside its release as well, and as we go through to 2001, this would remain the game plan for LEGO's line of sets for the then 4 movie long saga. The design philosophy for these sets came from the other products LEGO had out at the time. This meant boxy builds that never struggled to be recognizable, but due to LEGO's production limitations at the time, certainly had a lot to be desired compared to the source material. But that was what you'd get with LEGO's charm at the time. See, most sets released just prior to this did have lots of specialized pieces for detail, but still had a core of very square and angular pieces outside of just a few exceptions. This is why sets like the Slave 1 and the Trade Federation MTT lacked some of the more defining curves you would be familiar with, but still were clear what they were. That didn't come without use for the more specialized parts of some of the other recent themes. The Trade Federation AAT would not nearly be close to the actual vehicle's shape without LEGO's UFO theme needing rounded elements to make the UFOs just the right shape, and would even carry over into the design of the original Millennium Falcon. Some cockpits were completely new with the theme, alongside now iconic elements like Qui-Gon Jinn's hair, which was one of the first new hair pieces for minifigs in years. It was very clear that, outside of the minifigure details they felt were satisfactory, not too many elements were made to add detail. And for someone who is used to the modern take on LEGO Star Wars, you might be confused why I would give sets like these the praise that I do. 
See, this was LEGO's first attempt at making products based off of something outside of their influence, and that meant compromise for the sake of it being a LEGO set. They weren't going to stray away from the design philosophies that made LEGO what it was, even if that meant shapes were not as smooth. You'll also see random splotches of color to break up segment colors, and also to diversify the part pool, which might not be pretty to some, but was just a part of how things were at the time. All of these sets were Lucasfilm approved as well, so definitely keep that in mind. What was so unique about these sets and served as a selling point was the idea of building and rebuilding the sets, likely in an effort to remind people, first and foremost, that these were LEGO sets, in case they had forgotten in the excitement of it being Star Wars. This was new territory for LEGO after all. All sets would feature alternate builds on the back of the box and instruction booklets, with some sets even coming with stylized comics on the back of the instructions to encourage this even further. Photos of the builds using parts from the set would appear in side panels to add further inspiration. As a kid, I could never figure any of these out, as awesome as some of them were as concepts. Of course, the minifigs here were something completely unique as well. They were all constrained to the same design language. Not quite the same art style as the original minifigures were, but consistent nonetheless. Back then, most themes each had an art style, even in the licensed themes, as the eventual LEGO Harry Potter theme proved in 2001. This was before LEGO ever considered the idea of having specific skin tones for characters, electing to go with a standard minifig yellow which defined their designs. It's honestly so crazy to think that the cult-like obsession over the little Star Wars minifigs all started here, and plenty of these ones specifically are highly coveted today. If you haven't been convinced yet that the sets in the initial wave of LEGO Star Wars truly encapsulated the wonder of LEGO at the time, LEGO pushed the envelope even further by basically consolidating all branches of their products under the LEGO Star Wars name. At the time, LEGO had just introduced its revolutionary Mindstorms programmable robots as one of many of their gimmick integrated sets. This one would see success, and with it eventually came two dedicated sets under the theme, specifically based off of Star Wars designs and sold as their own sets. Something LEGO was also trying out were minifig packs, a line of sets that would often include three minifigs with card-backed stands you could easily display. Some stuck to the more iconic characters, while others were primarily just army builders, a concept truly lost to time. There was also an entire sub-theme dedicated to LEGO Technic builds, the focus being primarily on droids, though they did make a stormtrooper too. The goal was primarily on functionality, and these sets did a pretty impressive job for the limitations at the time. But perhaps the most important sub-theme, released in 2000, the Ultimate Collector's Series. Yes, UCS sets were one of the earliest concepts LEGO had for the theme outside of your typical sets. Now, the original do suffer from similar choices in design philosophy the smaller sets had, but still managed to retain and embrace the idea that they were sculptures. This era of LEGO Star Wars, the beginning of it all, really felt like a prototype of what could be, and honestly showed how simplified the part system LEGO developed had become, but too few knew that at the time. Within this era, you have the start of the often challenging balance for LEGO to have sets based off of what's new and what's old, as it seemed that for every single original trilogy set, there was a set based off of The Phantom Menace as well. Those original trilogy sets were restricted to only the most iconic ones, as plenty of other important Star Wars scenes did not make the cut until several years down the line. What was also quite neat was that these sets lasted longer on the shelves than most usually would, as LEGO wanted to ensure that those very same iconic sets remained on shelves for as long as the theme was running. So while sets were releasing in 2001, you could still pick up the one you wanted from 1999. As time would go on from here, a lot of the sensibilities that made these sets the way they were slowly would be abandoned in favor of new ideas, all through the help of revolutionary choices made to bolster LEGO's original themes. Thanks to working with Lucasfilm, LEGO began to understand the power of intellectual property, and even how to tackle working alongside media projects in a way they never had before. All of this, an inspiration to compete against Pokemon, and a surprising situation with a benign brain tumor, would birth one of LEGO's first original themes meant to hit like a big bang that would assist in planting the seeds of LEGO escaping their incoming bankruptcy, alongside LEGO Star Wars. That theme was LEGO Bionicle. And side by side, they began to teach LEGO more lessons, through success, that were it not for this rather humble of beginnings, we would not have LEGO today. And while the discourse on whether LEGO should abandon or embrace licensed IPs is tossed around these days, I think it's clear we need to come to the conclusion that, simply, there isn't a LEGO without one or the other. 
Original in-house LEGO themes would not exist without the licensed sets being such a huge success. And new parts to make the licensed sets excellent would not exist without the parts the in-house themes bring. It's this beautiful symbiosis allowing the business of LEGO to survive. And we have LEGO Star Wars to thank for that. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. If you liked the video, please hit the like button and let me know down in the comments if you have any memories of these sets, as well as if you'd like to see this series of the eras of LEGO Star Wars continue. If you'd like to support the channel, you can join Rakuten with a link in the description that saves you money on top of getting you cash back when you join. The channel earns a kickback if you do. You can also donate to the channel by using the thanks button. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when the next era releases, unless you see it on the end screen now, alongside these other videos you might like. I'm Penn, and I'll see you next time.